This area is known for the high demand for old historic houses, but you can also find modern houses from the 20s and 30s at reasonable prices. In addition to a collection of woodworking tools worth $20,000 and a heated garage, an elderly man purchased new tools after retirement but never found the time to learn how to use them. I joined the work of the local historical society, offering my time and help, hoping to find a suitable partner. But at the age of 45, the choice of single women aged 35 to 40 was limited, and there are frankly not so many suitable candidates. The level of education of year-round residents varied, while summer visitors tended to be better off than I preferred. One of the members of the historical society asked me to help solve the problem with the electricity on his yacht. I enjoyed the company of this elderly gentleman, and we spent Saturday working on the boat together and fixing various problems during a short cruise. I discovered a new love for sailing, and he appreciated having someone who could keep him company. We agreed on an exchange, I would service the mechanical and electrical aspects of the boat in exchange for sailing lessons. He hired a man who constantly restored and cleaned his boat, and I could take it whenever I wanted, as long as I called first. If it was a day trip, we often went together. I could have bought a boat myself, but I'm economical and didn't want to take on the burden of ownership and maintenance. While standing on the pier and changing the oil in the auxiliary engine, I heard a noise, some kind of boat was trying to dock. I quickly grabbed the boat hook and rushed there, realizing that the tide was against them. I called for the stern rope. The throw was short, but I managed to hook it and pull the stern up to the dock. The pond and the tide helped to push the bow, which allowed me to catch and secure the traction rope. The man behind the wheel, clearly drunk, persistently invited me to join their dinner party at a posh restaurant. I politely declined, not wanting to spend the evening with a noisy group of drunks. However, a beautiful woman approached Captain Ram and invited me to join them for dinner, putting aside all concerns. Wallace, you saved us, she said. Her appearance said a lot about her, she was sober, without rings on her left hand, pleasant-looking, educated with a slight British accent, and had a body designed for comfort. Will you join me for dinner? She repeated the question. Laughter and teasing came from the boat. I got her attention, and she attracted mine, I thought. Well done, Heather, they teased her from the boat. We were fascinated by each other. Heather, seven years younger than me, worked in a law office in Washington, D.C., drafting laws and regulations for lobbyists. She was truly stunning. She may not be a Hollywood beauty, but she could definitely stand out in a crowd. During the conversation, I discovered that she and I had similar political views, a common passion for antiques, the ocean, and reading. Although she once struggled with not being able to have children, she eventually came to terms with it. As for me, my own past experiences had made me completely come to terms with this fact. Heather, I don't want this evening to end. Could you stay at my place? I have a guest room with a secure lock on the door, although it depends only on you. Do you have a driver's license? Give them to me, she asked. I handed them over, and she quickly took a picture of them on her phone and then emailed them. Well, now if I don't come back safe and sound, my mom will come for me, she joked. Can you take me to the Waldorf on Sunday night, she asked. Sure, but where's the Waldorf? As we were leaving the restaurant, I noticed that there was no taxi nearby. I waved to a couple of elderly women whom I knew well and who were also about to leave. I asked them if they could give us a ride to the marina where my car was parked. One of them had already arranged blind dates for me twice and was glad that I was interested in Heather. After meeting Grace and Julia, whose name is Lily, they began to playfully tease Heather. Lily began by saying, she's just a godsend for Chesterton. I've tried to set him up with a few local girls, but none of them are as beautiful as you. If you marry him, you'll have to agree to stay here with us, Grace added. He cooks well, does well, and earns well, and he's always so kind to the older ladies in town. Heather did not lose her head and replied with her playful joke, Well, if all the young women in the area have turned him down, maybe I should proceed with caution, they must know something that I don't. Heather jokingly said, Or maybe you just appreciate what you have, Jeffrey is rude, but he doesn't need protection, Lily concluded, Ladies, please, I only met Heather this afternoon, you can scare her away. I jokingly stopped their argument. We didn't have any intimate relationships that weekend, but the next weekend we went on a yacht and had a passionate meeting. As we were both coming out of a period of abstinence, Heather was the exact opposite of my ex-wife in terms of looks. If my ex was short, thin, and blonde, then Heather was almost the same height as me, with a beautiful, rounded body and black hair. 
She had a unique background. Her father was from Avery, England, and her mother was from Madras, India. One of the best things about our relationship was the ability to laugh at each other's jokes. But Heather differed from my ex-wife in some not very pleasant ways. Unlike Andrea, who was ready to try everything she read about or saw in a racy movie, Heather was more restrained and not so adventurous. However, Heather enjoyed making love. But she was quite reserved. This confused me. She spoke confidently about her desires, but in the bedroom, she seemed indecisive and withdrawn. Despite the fact that she easily managed to reach a climax, she considered such actions as intimate conversations and making love outdoors inappropriate and disrespectful. I was thinking about ending my relationship with her until one cool autumn day we stopped by Chesterton on Saturday. That evening, I managed to treat her to two drinks at the restaurant and then a glass of wine at the house, which helped her relax. Heather, some people find making love disgusting or humiliating, believing that love should be worthy in the bedroom. Personally, I think our role is to satisfy each other's desires, and your pleasure should be my priority, and vice versa, I began the conversation. Jeffrey, don't you like being around me? What do you mean? What is it? She asked. You and I have a passionate and intimate love, and you have succeeded in this, but there is also a desire for a more intense and playful intimate experience that we have yet to explore. I want to indulge in a love game tonight, I replied playfully without going into details. I will say that our evening ended with a satisfactory climax. It was the first step in teaching her the art of pleasant and fulfilling lovemaking. Every week, weather permitting, we sailed together on the Chesapeake Bay. Often the weather was so pleasant that we could undress, go out to the water, and enjoy a cold beer, a refreshing swim, and passionate intimacy. We cuddled under a cozy blanket while the boat rocked us gently in our sleep, and then woke up to make love in the crisp morning air. It was that autumn that we discovered that we had fallen deeply in love with each other. Despite the fact that Chesterton's lifestyle is far from Washington, we were only an hour and a half away from each other. Closer to winter, she decided to sell her apartment in Waldorf and rent a place in Washington, and eventually moved to my place in Chesterton. She has a somewhat flexible schedule, most weeks she spends a couple of nights in Washington and the rest with me. I proofread her work, but not so much on the subject of spelling and grammar as on the subject of clarity and completeness. I can't say that I fully understand everything she writes, but at the moment I can follow her. If I can't, then there's a problem. She is more sociable than I am, but I also like being surrounded by people. We both like to go out with her friends in the city and my friends near home. Life is good. On Sunday morning, she had to go to Washington to prepare for the case for the next few days. To my surprise, the city council meeting I attended on Monday ended earlier than expected. Wanting to surprise her, I drove up to her apartment at around 9.30 a.m., but she wasn't there. I tried to call her, but the phone immediately switched to voicemail. The memory of being caught off guard by my cheating ex-wife made me worry. An hour later, she called me back, explaining that she was on a break but she would work late into the night. We chatted and found a common language. I was wondering how to find out about her whereabouts when she suddenly informed me. This week has been pretty chaotic. On Sunday, we discovered that our Chicago office had violated federal truck regulations, so today we all moved to the Weston in Fairfax to complete the assignment by 2 o'clock tomorrow. I doubt I'll be able to sleep tonight, but there is also a positive thing. I will be able to return to Chesterton a day earlier, Heather told me. Great. As it turned out, the council meeting ended earlier, and I decided to surprise you. I'm already in the apartment, I happily informed her. Oh, you must be very tired. Stay the night. I'll be back around noon or earlier, and we can have lunch together, Heather offered. Normally I would agree, but I'll have to come back in the morning, and you'll be too tired. I'm sorry I missed you, but at least I'll be able to smell you on the sheets when I get into bed. I'll be thinking about you, I replied. Tomorrow, I'll take a long nap in the apartment and come back for a late dinner. I love you, Heather told me. A week later, she confessed, I realized that I needed to turn off my phone more often during meetings or just to focus. I wasn't sure who was calling, so I decided to buy a smartphone specifically for us. We could set it up so that you can track my location and be calm. I don't need to know. I trust you, I assured her. She grinned and replied. I trust you too, but this phone feature can be useful for other reasons. So she gave me knowledge, a double-edged sword like in the story of Adam and Eve. I checked her location several times, 
but eventually stopped. We enjoyed seven years of good luck, just like in the Bible. I couldn't believe what was happening when I opened the door one Saturday morning and saw my ex-wife standing there. I was immediately overwhelmed by a wave of emotions and muttered, you're dead to me, as I closed the door. I realized that Heather had overheard this conversation. She asked, who was that? I reluctantly admitted that it was my ex-wife and described my reaction at that moment. There was another knock on the door. Heather offered to invite her into the house, but I stood my ground and said that she was not welcome in my house. Heather was upset and insisted that we treat her with kindness because she is a guest. It was clear that she was not all right, otherwise, she would not have come. Heather greeted her with a smile as she opened the door. My husband mentioned that you are Andrea. It's nice to finally meet you. I'm Heather, she said. Upon closer inspection, she shuddered. Andrea had always been slim, but now she looked emaciated, with sunken eyes and cheeks. At first, I thought, what did I find in her, and then I couldn't help but wonder if she was seriously ill. Andrea looked at me wearily and apologized for the intrusion, assuring me that she would not be late. Heather smoothly interjected, don't worry about it. We'll stay at home this afternoon. We were thinking of going somewhere, but Jeffrey needed to do some yard work related to watering. Heather said that and looked at me expectantly. I took the hint and went outside, telling them to call me when the coffee was ready. After about 20 minutes, Heather called, coffee's ready. I had just finished pouring the last quart of oil into the mower and headed into the house to clean up and have a cup of coffee. I joined them as they were finishing their conversation. I felt a sense of peace come over me. It dawned on me that I had no affection for Andrea. No love, no hate, no meaningful emotions at all. Looking at the two of them, I realized that I would be better off without her. The coffee mugs were empty, symbolizing the end of an era. After all this time, I realized that this was not just a casual visit from Andrea, and I was right. My youngest daughter, who is only seven years old, needs a kidney transplant, she said. The news hit me like a ton of bricks. No, it was an unusual conversation. I knew she had a daughter in Buchanan, but mine? Impossible. I've never seen her. So why don't you take your money and go to Switzerland or somewhere else to sort this out? It's not my problem, I started the conversation. So why are you here? I asked the question. My husband is infertile, and when I handed you the envelope, I anticipated your skepticism. So I took the DNA results. I didn't have your DNA at hand, but all your children have the same father, Andrea began. She is your children's sister, your own flesh and blood. Unfortunately, we can't find a suitable kidney donor for her because she has complete kidney failure. Jeffrey, the doctors think you might be right for her. I'm not a good fit myself, so I'm asking you to get tested to see if you can save her life by becoming a kidney donor. I am ready to generously reward you for this kindness, Andrea offered with tears in her eyes. Heather noticed my agitation and intervened, suggesting that we spend some time studying the information received by email and discussing it further before making a decision. She suffers every day, Andrea pleaded. Andrea, please let me talk to Jeffrey. I'll call you in two days, I promise, Heather said, looking for one of my business cards in the desk. When Andrea left, I couldn't resist making a sarcastic comment. It's nice to hear that the number of my former children is growing. Please keep me informed if there are any new ones. Be careful on the way back. I closed the door while Heather continued to talk to Andrea, walking her to her car. I warmed up a cup of coffee in the microwave, outraged at the audacity of this woman flaunting her wealth, and then went to my workshop. Later, I was invited to dinner by Heather, who was extremely worried. Her child is seriously ill, her condition is slowly deteriorating, and the only hope is a favor from a man who despises her. Adding to her troubles is that her marriage is on shaky ground, she began the conversation. That's the end of it. I don't hate her. I just can't stand her, and not because she left me, but because she separated my children from me. I replied threateningly, she thinks it's hard for her to come to terms with the loss of a child. My children may not have died physically but they may well be dead because they don't take an active part in my life. I have doubts that the children are really mine, but I don't think she would lie about it. I continued indignantly, if they had done a kidney compliance test, we would have found out the truth quickly. We need to learn more about kidney disease, transplantation, and related issues. Heather replied calmly, I didn't make any promises to her, except that I mentioned that I would call her on Tuesday. 
the child's condition is stable but not ideal. She continued to insist, I'm here to support you no matter what happens. After doing a little research on Wikipedia and on the website of the National Kidney Foundation, I learned that a child in need of a kidney transplant may not survive without a new kidney due to a shortage of donors. The best chance of success is if the donor is next to the recipient. Although the child may eventually receive a kidney transplant, the waiting period will be difficult, and there is still a risk of kidney failure, she concluded on Sunday evening. I poured Heather a glass of the special wine that we usually reserve for guests, not what we usually have on the table. I can't stand this woman and would love to get rid of her, leaving her in a difficult situation, and she's still the same as always. If she didn't need me so much, she wouldn't even mention my daughter, I said. But you have to go through with it, you understand that, don't you? Heather asked. What is it exactly? I asked. Put her in a difficult position or give her a kidney. Heather said with a smile. We both laughed, relieving the tension. I hope everything will be fine with the child. I wish your children would take more part in our lives, and you wouldn't have to lose a kidney. But if I had a child, Heather remarked sadly, I am ready to do anything to save her, and I know that you share these feelings. Your decision to donate your kidney to her is a reflection of the strength, courage, and dedication that I saw in you even before our wedding, Heather concluded. While we are overcoming this difficult situation, I cannot help but feel the weight of pain and responsibility on my shoulders, as well as on my daughter's shoulders, I replied. Do you know what I really want? I asked, feeling uncertain. She gently patted my hand and replied with a smile, No, I never thought about it. What do you want? And then it dawned on me that this is a question that I need to answer to myself. After reflecting on my past, I realized that I was so focused on providing for my family and maintaining our home that I didn't cherish the moments I spent with my children until they grew up and left. Now faced with a daughter I barely knew, I longed to be a part of her life. I wanted to create memories with her, like standing proudly next to her at graduation. I was wondering, they still have proms, don't they? Heather nodded in agreement. I want to raise her the way I would like to raise my older children. That's my wish, I replied. But Jeffrey, do you really want custody? She would never agree to this. Besides, it would be too traumatic for the child, Heather replied. I would like to see Karen on weekends, maybe it will work. I think she might consider giving us custody, I suggested. It reminded me of the story of Solomon's trial, two women were fighting over a baby, and Solomon offered to cut it in half. One woman agreed, and the other renounced her claims, ready to give up the child to save his life. Solomon declared her the true mother. Andrea will do the same, but I want her to deserve it, Jeffrey. You can't do this. You can't use custody as a bargaining chip to donate a kidney. A kidney for a child, eh? Child for a kidney. What are you even thinking about? Heather asked the question. I have so many thoughts in my head right now. You're right. I can't claim custody in exchange for my kidney. The child will receive my kidney unconditionally, but I can't help but think that Andrea shouldn't know about this many years ago. I tried my best to get rid of anger, and I succeeded, but meeting Andrea and that hidden child brought it all back. I replied, the memories came flooding back. I also had a desire to get back at Andrea, but I kept it to myself. When talking to Heather that evening, we outlined the details of the deal and one of Heather's colleagues offered to arrange it in the form of a legally binding document. Just before our trip to Greenville, I inserted an extra page at the end, painstakingly searching for the right font to make everything fit perfectly. On Monday, he organized a family meeting with Andrea, her husband James, and my three eldest children. We clarified that Karen should not be present, as it was reasonable. The day before, I went for a tissue analysis, which confirmed that she was my daughter and that I was suitable for kidney donation. At the same time, Heather spent the day with Andrea and the kids, and they got along great. The next day, Heather and I met with the Buchanans. James looked annoyed by the situation, Andrea was visibly worried, and my other children were also concerned, but they all looked quite healthy. After the research, I believe that the Kidney Foundation is a worthy charity, and I want to support them. Looks like you were right, Andrea. Karen is my daughter, and fortunately, I am suitable for the role of a donor for her kidney transplant. But you're asking me to undergo major surgery, remove one of my kidneys, and give it to a stranger, I replied. But she's your daughter, my ex-wife objected. No, she's James and Andrea Buchanan's child, I gestured at them. 
you all suddenly disappeared from my life without warning, and none of you bothered to mention Karen until it became absolutely necessary. I have a feeling that you will hide Karen from me too as soon as you get what you wanted from me, and the burden of all this will fall on me alone. None of you will experience any consequences or pain. None of you seem to be interested in this situation. I'm sorry, but procreation is not a priority for me, I replied. Deep pain and despair were reflected on Andrea's face. We are ready to do whatever it takes to save her, Andrea replied. I thought for a moment to realize the gravity of the situation. What do you need? What is it? She asked. Well, I have two requests. First of all, I want to spend 72 days a year with my daughter. That's 20% of the time she spends with Heather and me. Andrea, do you think that's fair? It will be two days off a month for a total of 48 days, plus a week or two in the summer, which will be about 15% of the time. That way, I'll have 15% of the time, and you'll have 85%. Does it suit you? I started giving ultimatums. So, you agree that it will be fair, she said, looking at her husband. He shrugged his shoulders and replied, more than fair, I think so too. We agree, she paused, considering the situation, and now, think about what I have to go through. A perfectly healthy person gets an incision and an organ is removed to help someone else live. How many of you in my place would agree to do what you forgive me, for raise your hand? The three women immediately raised their hands, followed a few seconds later by her two sons, and then James hesitantly raised his hand. So, you're all ready to do what you're asked to do, I concluded. When they looked at each other and nodded understandingly, it became clear that this was a mutually beneficial deal that would benefit the Kidney Foundation as well. The plan has been developed, Andrea and I will donate one kidney each, one to Karen and one to the transplant program. After my surgery, James will step forward and donate the kidney to the foundation. In exchange, Karen gets my kidney and I get custody of her. A 15% timesharing agreement was proposed, which all parties considered fair. The promise to become heroes of a newspaper served as an additional motivation. James realized the significance of their action. You'll get a lot of approval for this, I said. And what do these merits mean to me? asked James. You can claim that this is your own idea. You will be even more generous because your donation will go not to relatives but to strangers, I replied. Everyone agreed, they were pleased with this decision. But James didn't look worried. I pushed him. Do you mind, James? He quickly put on the look of a happy man. Of course, of course, it's a noble thing to do, and it will benefit many people. So why not? He answered quickly. Everyone smiled and nodded. Andrea expressed her gratitude. Thank you, Jeffrey. You have no idea how much this means to me. Andrea began with tears in her eyes. You're wrong, Andrea. I understand how important this is to you, even more than you think, I replied. It was decided that Andrea, James, and I would become kidney donors. Everyone nodded in agreement. So here's the contract that you all have to sign. There's a penalty clause on the penultimate page. This is my second condition. Andrea and James must put their initials and the date. I continued my terms, James immediately became serious. What is this contract about? James asked incredulously. We are one family, there is no need for that, I tried to answer. I refuse to sign the contract because you annoy me with your pomposity. We can all be considered one family, but there are different family units in our group. My wife and her children make up one family, and Andrea, the children, and I make up another. The concept of family in this context is somewhat confusing. The contracts are beneficial because they clearly state the terms of the agreement in advance, including any penalties, James replied threateningly. If for some reason one of you is unable or unwilling to donate a kidney, Heather and I will take custody of Karen. She will take my last name, and the custody agreement that we all agreed on earlier will be adjusted so that she stays with us 85% of the time, and you stay with us 15%. We will move to this new agreement gradually. But if one of you refuses, then in the spring, Karen will be enrolled in a school in Chesterton. I formulated the terms of the agreement roughly like this. Let's avoid chaos, guys, just stick to the plan, Heather began consolingly. The agreed result was recognized as fair by all parties. If one of them refuses, I will get custody of one of my four children, Andrea was the first to agree, stating, let's not be greedy. Karen's survival was a priority for everyone. Andrea signed the agreement, 
but James hesitated. Jeff asked about the consequences of not fulfilling the agreement. I calmly replied, Andrea and I will donate the kidneys, and you will do nothing, and Karen will die. When I come out of the operating room and find out that you weren't there, there may be some problems. I received a letter from the Kidney Foundation saying that if I donate two kidneys to them, they will give preference to Karen on the transplant list. I promise you that I will do it. What could be better than my word? I replied. Andrea was visibly upset. Please sign this, James. Think about our daughter, Andrea pleaded. James hesitated, not knowing what to do. Andrea interrupted him, just sign it. There's no need to finish this thought. James silently signed the contract. A week later, Andrea underwent surgery, and as soon as the surgeon took a break and changed his clothes, they began to operate on me. When I woke up from anesthesia in the intensive care unit, I was transferred to a separate hospital room. Heather was next to me in the intensive care unit, but as soon as I was in a private room, she and Macy came in to chat. Heather told me about Andrea's condition and assured me that the doctor said I was fine. Macy met my gaze and expressed regret that James and Andrea were trying to make me look bad. Dad, it was like we were part of some kind of almost cult mentality. It seemed that we were sacrificing ourselves for the sake of the future. Looking back now, it seems silly, but we were just kids. James and Mom were in their own world, Macy said, she started crying. I would like to hug you and comfort you, but I can't right now, I replied, but Heather was there, she hugged Macy. We forgive you, and so does Dad. You were just a kid then, and you tried your best. Let's focus on the future, Heather said comfortingly. Jeffrey, I want you to become an important part of our lives, my son Mike said as he entered the room. It's good that you're awake. I also decided to donate a kidney. I signed up for this while you were under anesthesia. Unfortunately, James refused and postponed it indefinitely, but it is unlikely that it will ever happen, my son said. God, Mike, I'm not sure this is a wise decision. You have a whole future ahead of you. I'm not sure you don't have to do this. You know the job is already done, your donated kidney doesn't absolve Jimmy of responsibility. That's not why my decision was made, I replied. Karen's move to us is definitely a positive moment. I believe it will be good for her. I promised to do it because my parents did the same, and it was the right thing to do. Seeing Karen suffer was hard, but I heard that my kidney could potentially help two people. Dad, you were right about Jamie, he didn't agree, he really doesn't like being called Jimmy. We got in trouble for calling him that, Mike said. Heather looked at me, and it dawned on her when she realized how I had organized the situation. I had a feeling that he wouldn't give up so easily, but I couldn't bring myself to admit it. Instead, I decided that he would be the main culprit for Andrea losing her daughter. I never really knew Jimmy, having first met him just a week ago, he seemed to me a little clamped down and out of place among us. It was clear that he didn't belong to us, especially now that he was gone. But who was he really to me? Despite this, I had the feeling that he cared about you in his own way. This week marked the beginning of a new chapter in my life, especially when we started spending weekends with Karen. One of her siblings accompanied her on the trip, and sometimes they both stayed all day, returning home only late at night on Sundays. Either my wife or I drove her back. In the end, we started inviting both Karen and her sister for the whole weekend. Since everything went smoothly, we extended their visit from Thursday evening to Sunday evening. Taking a friend's boat at our disposal, we spent the summer yachting, fishing, and swimming. We even took Karen and her sister on vacation to Washington, after which we made a similar trip with the boys. We decided to extend our trips by an extra day because the kids were so passionate about the Smithsonian Museum that we couldn't tear them away. At the end of the summer, Andrea came to Karen, and we started talking. Andrea looked as calm and contented as I'd ever seen her. Heather has kindly given us time to talk in private. Andrea confessed to me about her strained relationship with James, which was news to me. On the other hand, Heather and I are fine. Maybe you should talk to her about it. It seems that in the past you both did something right, since the children turned out to be good, although James did not take much part in their upbringing, Heather suggested to me. He looked more like an older friend than a father, don't you think? I asked Andrea. I understand how hard it was for you and those who tried to help, Andrea said. As far as. I've noticed, he doesn't seem to appreciate hard work and self-sacrifice. I suppose if you have enough money, you can afford to waste time on an empty activity, I replied. 
Were you trying to drive a wedge between us? She asked. Andrea, when you left me, you didn't give a damn about my feelings, and now I don't think about you at all. I just wanted Karen to have a normal life like you, and for my children to come back into my life, I replied sadly. I was ready to share, but I was deeply outraged that you didn't do the same. It bothered me more than the divorce, but now it's all in the past. I've come to terms with it, Andrea said. So what's your problem with him? I asked. A question. I feel betrayed. I lost Karen, my child, and now he's cheating on me, Andrea said quietly. I almost choked, but then I couldn't help but laugh when I saw the look on her face. I burst out laughing. You're a hypocrite. You were perfectly content when you cheated on me, your husband, and hid him from me and then the children, weren't you? I asked angrily. Do you really think that I will sympathize with you? In the end, everything has to be fair. I understand how you feel, and I agree that no one should give up a child. Maybe it's time to start looking for a good divorce lawyer. Will you still be rich after all is said and done, or have you signed a prenuptial agreement? I asked with a laugh. She couldn't help but laugh with me. Jeffrey, you will never stop making me laugh, she replied with tears in her eyes. Yes, justice has been served, but from my point of view, it is not very pleasant. There is a prenuptial agreement, but financially, I will still benefit, Andrea replied. But happiness is a completely different story. You'll have to figure that out on your own. It looks like you missed an important life lesson, I said sadly. It is very important to understand what brings you joy and find a partner who will support and encourage your happiness. You must decide on your desires and take the necessary steps to achieve them. If James is not right for you, don't be afraid to move on and develop a plan to get out of the relationship. Remember what you did before, start searching, and when you meet a person who will support you during the divorce process, think about ending your relationship with your current spouse and getting married for the third time. You're still young and fashionable, financially stable, and you love sports like golf and tennis, I began to cheer her up. Looking for advice on how to improve your personal life? Call Heather. She's been through all this and knows how to deal with it. After her husband left her, she did something that helped her. She will definitely be able to understand your situation better. Than I do. I finished giving advice. Andrea left in the afternoon, and later Heather, Karen, and I went into town for dinner that night. As we lay in bed, I told Heather about our conversation. She couldn't help but laugh when I mentioned that James treated her the same way she treated me. It wasn't very pleasant, she said, stifling a laugh. Do you think she was trying to flirt with you? Heather asked. That's such an outdated expression, isn't it, to flirt with me? I laughed. Don't be silly. She sees how happy we are, how much we love each other. I interrupted Heather's sad thoughts. Heather and I had a great time that night without waking Karen up. As a result, Andrea moved to Florida and invited us all there for Thanksgiving. She ordered dinner, but it was terrible according to our arrangements. The children took turns spending Christmas and New Year with us. We were always going to a big Fourth of July picnic in Chesterton. The children kept in touch with James, who provided for them financially. Personally, I've only seen James twice, at Macy's wedding and Michael's wedding. When Jason and Edward got married, we held a ceremony in Chesterton, but James did not respond to the invitation. To his credit, he did send them a check a few weeks later. Andrea spent a fortune on cosmetic surgery in an attempt to preserve her appearance. Despite this, surgery has not been able to change her inner world. Over time, she became embittered and envious. The children decided that she would come to them for the holidays in turn so that none of them would have to endure her company too often. It is rumored that she has had many romantic partners over the years. It was a happy period of life for us. My family and I are doing well. On the way home, I received an unexpected message from Linda. She shared how much she enjoyed our time together and offered to repeat it the next time I have to leave for work. She also mentioned that she didn't want to wake up next to someone else and that she would miss our daily intimacy. Shocked by her words, I stopped to read the message again, realizing that this was not a mistake. I answered briefly, find a lawyer, referring to our prenuptial agreement. I thought she would agree to have only one lawyer mediate our divorce. Throwing my phone on the seat, I drove home, ignoring her attempts to call and text me. When I entered the house, I heard her talking on the phone with a man about our situation. She didn't realize I was home until I told her, honey, I'm home. 
Shock showed on her face. She dropped the phone in horror. I asked, are you talking to a lawyer? She tried to convince me that it was all a joke, but I didn't believe her. Going into the bedroom, I took off the bed linen and packed it in black plastic bags. Despite Linda's tears and her assurances that it was a hoax, I was not convinced. The betrayal was too painful to ignore, and I knew I needed to act to move on. While collecting the bed linen, I realized that I needed two bags because the plaid did not fit together with the sheets and blanket. Ignoring Linda's pleas, I carried the bags to the car and threw them in the trunk. I suspected that this was the bedding she had been using with another guy over the past week, possibly leaving evidence of their affair. I didn't really need proof, but I left the laundry just in case. When I returned to the house, Linda rushed to me, begging for forgiveness and claiming that it was all a joke. I told her that it was a cruel joke and that we would discuss everything only in the presence of a lawyer. I gave her one chance to justify herself before telling her that I sent the laundry to the laboratory for analysis. The truth would come out sooner or later, and I was ready for it. She didn't say much, just nodded in agreement. Discovering that it was Richard, my shock was palpable. He was my friend. There was an awkward silence in the room. Breaking it, I asked if she had a place to live, but... She looked puzzled. I made it clear to her that she would no longer stay in my house. Pack your things and go to your parents. Your things will be sent to you, I informed her sternly. She collapsed to the floor, sobbing uncontrollably. I had to repeat to her, no, 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 while she tried to repeat that she loved me and that it didn't mean anything. I knew I had to force her to make a decision, so I gave her an ultimatum, she could pack up and leave on her own, or I would take her and her stuff out into the yard. It was my family's house, which came to me when my parents moved to a warmer climate. Linda didn't have any rights to the house. To make sure I was acting within my rights, I called my father and explained the situation. After he finished swearing, he asked how he could help. I asked him to write to my wife and request that she vacate the house. She could have resisted and forced us to go through the eviction process, but she knew it wasn't in her best interest. Linda packed up her things and started looking for her car key in the garage. I couldn't find my phone because I had taken it out of Linda's purse when I was packing. The problem with Linda is her laziness. When we went to buy a car, she refused to help with the paperwork, which resulted in both cars being in my name. Considering her cheating, I decided not to let her take one of the cars. Additionally, payments for both cars were debited from my personal bank account. I met with her and made it clear that both cars were registered in my name, suggesting that she call her parents or take an Uber. Linda went berserk and started yelling at me, accusing me of rudeness. I stood my ground and warned her not to test my patience. She backed away, and I demanded her phone. She hesitated, but I reminded her that I had proof of purchase of the phone on my credit card. I offered her an old phone from her desk drawer and suggested she get her own phone line since I was once again the only one who signed a contract with T-Mobile. Reluctantly, she handed over the phone and took the old one out of the drawer. I found out a lot of information about this novel later because, as I expected, Linda was lazy and always used one of three passwords. This time it was just the four digits of her year of birth. After escorting her out, I stood at the door until her parents arrived. When they got out of the car, Linda burst into tears again and sought comfort from her mother. Her father came up to me with a serious expression on his face and asked about the situation. I took out my phone and showed him the message she had sent me. His face paled as he read it, and he nodded apologetically. After they left and Linda's things were packed, that was the last conversation I had with my now ex-wife. It was only at the end of that week that we met at the lawyer's office for mediation. It was my second marriage, and after the turmoil of the first one, I made it clear to Linda at the very beginning of our relationship that I would never remarry without a prenuptial agreement. She seemed indifferent but didn't mind the idea because it was fair. We just divided our joint banking assets equally and agreed that each of us would be responsible for our own credit cards and debts. We didn't have any cards in common, and most of the debt was in my account since Linda only used hers for social outings with friends to places like Starbucks. The prenuptial agreement also stated that in the event of a divorce, there would be no alimony or access to each other's pension funds. This is just a simplified version of the agreement. The intermediary lawyer we hired carefully examined all our assets and their value during the divorce process. Thanks to the prenuptial agreement, Linda received half of our bank funds, including savings. 
she was allowed to keep everything she bought with her credit card, although most of the large purchases were made with my card, including most of her jewelry. I didn't challenge her decision because I didn't need those things. In addition, I allowed her to choose any furniture she wanted to keep. Despite Linda's attempts to communicate with me, I refused to engage in any discussions. The betrayal associated with her full-blown affair was too strong to overcome. Fortunately, Linda's medical history did not allow us to have children, as she had several miscarriages due to a scar on the uterus formed after a previous abortion. After an emotional struggle with losses, we decided to stop trying to conceive a child. Our divorce was quick and drama-free thanks to the prenuptial agreement and the mediator. It lasted six months mainly because of the mandatory waiting period although. I'm not a Hollywood hunk, but at 30, I'm still in decent shape. My wife was attractive, but the lack of motivation was starting to make itself felt. Surprisingly, I found her gentleness attractive, as did her partner in the novel. I'm sure it won't be difficult for her to find someone new. I never found out what happened to her partner. Linda claimed that they broke up because she confessed her love to me during a heated argument. I suspect she was telling him a very different story, which led to his decision to leave. Have I forgiven Richard? No. After the divorce, I met him at his house and informed him that I had divorced the woman he was involved with. It was time for him to face the consequences. I explained to him that although it hurt me when my wife cheated on me, I would not be able to forgive my friend's betrayal. I had been preparing for this confrontation for six months. In the past, I couldn't stand up for myself when I lost love, but this time I was ready. He yelled at me, accusing me of ruining his relationship with Linda, and tried to attack me. In self-defense, I punched him in the nose, knocking him down. I kept hitting him, tears streaming down my face with every punch. After months of pent-up frustration and anger, I finally stood up for myself. Emotions overwhelmed me and I couldn't contain the anger that had built up inside. I kept hitting him until he lost consciousness. After sitting next to his motionless body for a few minutes, I finally dialed 911. The ambulance arrived quickly and took him to the hospital. I ended up in handcuffs and was taken to the police station. Surprisingly, I was released that evening because Richard did not press charges. The next day, I received a short message from Richard that said, We're even. That's how this chapter in my life ended. Despite the appearance of indifference, I was deeply worried about Linda. The pain of the situation weighed heavily on me because I had already gone through a divorce at the age of 20. I didn't plan for a third one. I wish all the best to those who go through similar trials and remember that a prenuptial agreement can be considered, which reduces stigma. According to my lawyer, they are more common than you might think. At our son's birthday party, my wife Jennifer betrayed me by cheating on me with an animator. That day, I realized the true value of normality as life plunged me into a world of absurdity. Even a simple pirate-themed holiday could be a reason for such unexpected events. After seeing my soulmate in the arms of another, I was forced to face the harsh reality of infidelity at a seemingly innocent party. Our son David was completely fascinated by the pirate's plunder game room. On his sixth birthday, he made one simple wish, to have a pirate's plunder-style party. Jennifer and I were happy to bring it to life. The venue was amazing, with large arcade-themed party rooms and two mascots, the pirate Captain Cutlass and the friendly shark Scalywack. All the children liked them, especially David. The day of the party turned out to be sunny and joyful. Jennifer did her best to prepare a party full of excitement and anticipation. Pirate-themed invitations, skull and crossbones balloons, and a treasure chest cake decorated the room while children ran around earning tickets and competing on slot machines. Laughter and fun filled the air. David was having fun, and Jennifer's eyes sparkled as she watched him play. As the party went on, I couldn't help but notice something strange. Captain Cutlass, the huge mascot, seemed more interested in Jennifer than in the children. They laughed together, posed for photos, and had a playful altercation. At first, I treated it as part of the celebration, but as they continued to communicate, it seemed less and less innocent. Even though I tried not to pay attention to it, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. Betrayal, anger, and resentment bubbled up inside me as I tried to make sense of what I had just witnessed. Jennifer's voice shouting my name followed me as I ran out of the building. My head was spinning with thoughts of how long this affair had been going on. I knew I couldn't stay in this moment any longer. I needed space to think about what had happened. Finding a quiet place under the nearest tree, I sat down and let my tears flow. 
My world was destroyed in an instant, and I had no idea how to pick up the pieces. When the sun started to set and the noise of the party faded into the background, I made a decision I couldn't ignore. What I saw, yet I couldn't look Jennifer in the eye. I needed time to heal and figure out what to do next. With a heavy heart, I got up and left, leaving behind the chaos of the party and the painful image of Jennifer in the arms of Captain Cutlass. We put fake smiles on our faces, determined not to let personal problems overshadow our son's special day. When we cut the cake, sang, and laughed, the joy seemed empty and forced. After the party was over and we loaded everything into the car, there was a suffocating silence between us. It wasn't until we got home that we finally started talking. David was lying in bed, his face still smeared with birthday cake. Jennifer tried to explain herself, but her words were ignored. As she spoke, cold anger boiled inside me, every word a painful reminder of her betrayal. It was just a mistake, she sobbed, tears streaming down her face. A mistake? You don't cheat on your husband by accident with a pirate mascot, I replied sharply. The sound of my voice filled the empty house, reverberating with the pain in my heart. I don't know what I was thinking. Forgive me, Jennifer whispered, her eyes begging for forgiveness. I wanted to believe her, but the trust was destroyed. I wanted to hold her close and forget about everything, but the image of her with Captain Cutlass continued to haunt me. Regret won't help, Jennifer, I said, my voice devoid of emotion. You broke us. You've ruined our family. I've ruined everything, Chris, she cried. I know I messed up everything. Please, let's talk for David's sake. But I was no longer able to reconcile. The woman I once loved, the mother of my child, had betrayed our vows and our family. Not trusting myself to make rash decisions, I realized that I needed space. We'll talk tomorrow, Jennifer, I announced with finality. I'll be in the guest room tonight. Jennifer nodded, tears still streaming down her cheeks. I left her in the living room, her sobs echoing in the empty house. Painfully recalling the events of that day, I lay in the guest bed with thoughts full of confusion and anger spinning in my head. I could not find peace. I tossed and turned, unable to sleep, the image of Jennifer in the arms of the mascot haunting me. Despite the pain it caused, I knew what needed to be done. The next morning, I found Jennifer in the kitchen with swollen, tear-stained eyes. David was sleeping peacefully, oblivious to the commotion between his parents. After I cleaned myself up, I took a deep breath and said the words I never thought I would say. Jennifer, I think it's time for a divorce. The words froze in the air, hanging over us like a guillotine, unchanging and oppressive. Jennifer's eyes widened, and for a moment, there was silence. Then the silence was broken by the noise of the house, a mournful reminder that the happiness in our home was now destroyed. Life, as it turned out, was unpredictable, with surprises like pirate mascots at a children's party. As I embarked on this new and unfamiliar journey, memories of the joy and innocence of the previous day filled my mind. Celebrating a child's birthday sparked a profound realization that changed my life forever. While grieving the end of my marriage, I understood that this marked the beginning of a challenging path. It would be a journey of self-discovery, healing, and, most importantly, shielding my son David from the fallout of our unfortunate situation. When the divorce was finalized, my son David remained in my care. The court determined that a mother who cheats on her husband at her own son's birthday party is not fit to be a positive influence on the child, 